and uh, it is a joy to see people here studying God's Word. Uh, that's one of the weaknesses we have in our churches today is people want to go to church once a week or twice a week, but they don't want to get into the Word of God and understand what it says and what it means. And Thank the Lord we have a good teacher that can help us in that endeavor. And we pray that uh, we receive the Lord's wisdom and not man's wisdom in our class. And just uh, thankful to be here. So I'd like to welcome everybody that's new. Who is new? Welcome. Uh, I haven't been here real regular, but I try to be here as often as I can. My granddaughter is at an award uh, program for one in chapter, so I slipped away. My wife stayed there, so anyway, she'll try to be here as much as possible, too. Thank you. Rebecca. Um, I've been coming to the class for some, well, four, almost five years now. So um, uh, I'm, it, it's, it's, um, he put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, this is a really good class. I have enjoyed it. I come during the one at time and then off and on in the summer when I can. And uh, I, I've never been in a Bible study that you dig so deeply into the Word, and it's a little bit overwhelming and kind of scary at first. You're like, what, what is he talking about? And then, but after you spend a little bit of time, you start to see it all come together, mm -hmm. and the the God's Word, studying it through the Greek is so much deeper than I ever studied in any of the versions that I've read. And... Um, so you just, if you hang in there, you learn quite a bit. And it and you don't even realize how much you're learning sometimes until you've looked back a, a year and you go, oh my gosh, I know that, and I know that, and I know that. And and it's all because of Jim and how God's just blessed him with, a, he's a great teacher. And he likes to bring in his own little personal stories, which keeps you entertained and keeps you your attention. And um, so welcome, and I hope that you don't get frightened off because it's not that bad. <laughs> it's a little scary and overwhelming at first, but then it's pretty good after that. Well, we study God's Word. I try to entertain you just a little bit. Uh, I've been teaching Greek almost 40 years, Greek and Hebrew. Uh, but I always teach the Bible from, the, or the Greek and Hebrew from the Bible, because I tell you what, it would be boring and overwhelming if you study. I taught Greek and Hebrew grammar, and I hated it, and every, all the students hated it. It's just so boring, it just, it's like death. <laughs> but when you study the Bible that is alive in those languages, and that is the inspired Bible, it just, whoo, just livens up, and there you are. Well, we're in... Uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians uh, is a wonderful book. Absolute wonderful book. It covers every problem in the modern church today is met by inspiration from the book of 1 Corinthians by the Apostle Paul. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, Brother John, would you lead us in prayer, brother?
I apologize for not being here last week. I was in the hospital, as most of you know, <laughs> having some tests, and I'm okay. Uh, one in verse 21, Paul the Apostle is writing to the church at Corinth. To the church at Corinth, okay? And we'll read it in Greek, and uh, then we'll go on from there deep into the language of the Bible. All right? The language of the New Testament. By the way, what is Koine Greek? What is Koine Greek? What does it mean? It means the universal language of that day. Everybody uh, knew Greek. That was the commerce language. That was the language of the whole uh, Greek empire. And then uh, the, Roman, the Roman Empire took over the Greek Empire, but actually the Greek Empire conquered the Roman Empire by culture. And uh, this is the language that Jesus spoke, and this is the language that he taught the Bible from was, was Greek. The, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, is what he spoke every day. Every now and then he'd speak a little Hebrew, if he spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, he would quote it in Greek, Hebrew or Aramaic, whichever one. All right. Epede. All right. Gar. And. Te. Sophia. To Theu. Uk. Agno. Ho. Cosmos. Dia. Te. Sophias. Ton Theon. Udo. Kesen. Ho. Theos. Dia teis, morias, tu kerugmatos. So say, tus. What does the last one say, Cindy? I have written mine up. Pistuontes. Pistuontos. All right. We'll look at every one of these. That first word, epede, means since or because of or as much as. All right. And then gar. It starts out with a gar. Four cents in wisdom. In te Sophia. Now, how many of you know someone named Sophia? All right. Do you know someone named Sophia? All right. I, I'd known Sophia Lauren, you know, and, and the movie star. What does Sophia mean? It means a wisdom that as far surpasses any other wisdom. It is a wisdom to use everything for the glory of God. It is one of the highest words for wisdom. We've looked at at five and, or six words for wisdom in the Bible. And we're going to look at a couple of them in this verse. All right? This one is the highest term for wisdom right here. The highest term. For in the wisdom of the God. That word to you there. To you. How about theology? You ever heard of the word theology? There's where it comes from right there. Theology means what? It comes from logos and theos. The study of God. Theology is the study of God. All right. And... The God is a definite article right in front of it. It's two. Two is a definite article that is genitive, singular, masculine. Definite article. Ho heristikon or throne in Greek. That is, is point out is the God. The wisdom of the God. The wisdom belonging to the God. This is a genitive case which is a case of possession. The wisdom, all true wisdom belongs to God. Isn't that what the book of James says? So what the book of James says, by the way, we'll cross-reference to other places in the Bible. The wisdom belonging to the God, and Rebecca, do you have your uh, uh, Amplified Bible open there also? We'll look at that in just a minute. All right, the wisdom of God, not it knew, the world. All right, the world there, that's the positive. By the way, in John 3 and 16, it says, for God so loved what? The cosmos. Not just man. God is going to redeem the whole world back to himself one of these days. The whole world. Everything in it. All of it. All the material universe. Except those that will not believe. And of course those angels and demon spirits that have already rejected him. That's going to be in file 13. All right. Not it knew the world. All right. Through the wisdom, the God. All right. Rebecca, you want to read the first part of that right up to where we are there, please? For when the world with all its earthly wisdom failed to perceive and recognize and know God by means of its own philosophy. All right. For 
folks, no, just hold on right there. We'll get on down a little bit further. Just hold your place. For in the wisdom of the God, not it knew the world, the world system. All right. Through the wisdom of the God. And then it says he, he thought or he deemed or he judged good. Look at that word, udokasin. All right. That's third person singular, first heiress, indicative active. Now, I don't want to scare you with that. That means it's very punctilier action, knife blade a action. Uh, first heiress is very point sharp action. For not it knew, or not he judged the God, all right, not he judged, it's eudokia. It, w it means his good pleasure, all right? Good pleasure, or judge the God, through the morios. Have you ever heard of a word moron? The word moron comes right out of this morios. All right, morios. That's where the word moron comes from. Of the proclamation, karugmatos, the proclamation, the preaching. The preaching of what? The gospel, the Bible. To save the ones believing, to save the ones pisiontes, the ones believing. James 4 and 4 and 5 and 20 and Romans 11 and 14, Luke 12 and verse 32, Galatians 1 and 15, Colossians 1 and 19 are cross reference to this, John 12 and verse 31. This is a. Have you ever been to a funeral? Have you ever been to a funeral of a lost person you know that did not go to heaven? That's bad, isn't it? That's a sorry, sorry, sad situation. There is no hope anywhere. All you can see is total doom. What this verse is doing, this is a funeral march for all the wisdom of the world. This is what we call a funeral dirge or a funeral march for all the wisdom of the world. Now, uh, Rebecca, you want to read that real loud again there? The whole verse now. All right, by the way, she's reading the Amplified Bible. That's a pretty good explanation of the Greek and the Hebrew. It is not perfect, as no translations are, but it, it is uh, pretty good. What translation do you have there? And what is your name? Uh, my name is Dick. My wife is Joyce, and I have the New American Standard. New American Standard, that's good. Uh, God's wisdom has reduced the world's wisdom then and now to based foolishness, to base foolishness, base ignorance, base ignorance. Even the religious world of the Jews and the Greeks and the Romans was a, was a religion of superstition, a religion of superstition. Uh, I think probably the most ridiculous religions in that day was uh, the Arabs of that time. They were afraid to spit, or if they fell down on the ground, they would apologize to the ground. They were so superstitious, so superstitious. But we said, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you kick the ground when you fall down, all right. Well, down to the ages, we see things. The Lord, when he when he landed on this earth in space and time, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was Jehovah. We know that. He's Jehovah. Uh, John 1 and 1 is mo one of the most beautiful things that you can ever see in the Bible. It's the most beautiful verse, I believe, in the Bible. In beginning was what? All right. In beginning, that word in beginning there is singular, it's not plural. In, Greek, in Hebrew, in Genesis 1 and 1, it says, Barashith bara. That means in beginnings. In one of the beginnings, God created the heavens and the earth. In one of the beginnings. The oldest verse in the Bible is John 1 and 1. That goes back further in time than any other. 
in a singular, locative, singular, feminine, in beginning. By the word, word, the word in, we see in this last verse that we just read, it's exactly the same as it is in English. Our word in in English came from the Greek word in, which means in, all right? In absolute beginning, nothing else was there back in the extremity of time. And then it was, we have the word was translated there, but that's not what it, what it means, is it? What should it be translated there? Third person singular, imperfect, indicative, active, ain. All right? In RK, ain hologos. Ain is what? How should it be translated? Cindy, you remember? No, not became. Brother Randall, you remember that one? In beginning, kept on being. Kept on being. Not was, kept on being forever. In beginning, kept on being, and then hologos, the word. How should that be translated? That is not a Greek idiom. That is a Hebrewism. How should we translate that word, Brother Randall? The Jehovah. All right? The Jehovah. In, huh? Which word is that in English? Logos. It, well, logos or, or word. Actually, it shouldn't be translated as word at all because it's talking about the Hebrew name of God. In the Old Testament, when they came to the, the word Jehovah, all right, when they came to this word, all right, it, uh, they didn't say it. It was too holy to say. Once they received the law of Moses, they never spoke the name of God again. This is his personal name. Never would speak it. They were afraid to. It says in the law, thou shalt not use the Lord thy God's name in vain. So they never spoke his name again. But they were referred to him as Havavar, or Hashem, or Adonai. So when John wrote the Gospel of John, the book of Revelation, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, when he wrote that, he was a Hebrew, wasn't he? Now he wasn't talking about that the Greeks had an idea of the word, the creator, okay? But this isn't the Greek idea. This is a Hebrewism. This is the Hebrew idea. So it says, in beginning kept on being the Jehovah. All right? And the Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead. Kai hologos ain proston theon. All right? And the word or the Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead. Did Jesus ever cease being God on this earth? Never. And then the last part of that verse says, because the word kept on being God. John 1, 14. John 1, 14. See, that explains all this. What's John 1, 14 say? Anybody quote that first part of it in Greek? Kai hologos sarx Kai and hologos and the Jehovah flesh he became. And the Jehovah flesh he became, and in the original language, in the Greek language, it says that he brought himself into flesh. He became for himself. He brought himself into this world. And, of course, it says that he displayed him, and we saw the glory, all the glory of Godhead. And then John 1.18. Can you read John 1? Are you close there, Brother Dick? John 1.18. Read John 1.18. This one just, it just misses the ball altogether. That's right. The only begotten God. Now, God begat himself. So here we have God beginning God. He is, Jesus is the eternal God. Jesus didn't begin. He always was. He's the eternal Son with the eternal Father, with the eternal Spirit. All right? So here they all are. Eternal God. And right there it says, and read that again. It, it, to start from the beginning there, Dick. All right. It says, who is in the bosom? It says, continuously being in the bosom of God. He was never separated. God tasted death on the cross of Calvary in the flesh of Jesus. The Spirit, the Father, tasted death. But it was not a defeat. It was a victory. And the last part of it there, it says what? The last word. All right. 
It comes from this word right here. Now, ek means what? Ek means what? Right up there means what? Out of it. Ek it means out of it. So this means out. All right? And I go as I lead, I bring, I go. And it's, by the way, it's in the middle voice there. Okay? He has led himself out, is what it should say from Greek. He has led himself out. Now he, Kaihologo Sarks again at all, and the Jehovah flesh he became for himself. Middle voice again. And then 118, he, he led himself out. Now the Jews, the Jews always wanted a sign, didn't they? Prove to us you're the Messiah. What was the Messiah supposed to do? According to the Old Testament, let's just lump it up in what we call summary, okay? What was some of the things that Jesus was supposed to do? What was the Messiah supposed to do? He, they said he would be a political American, uh, military leader. But what family is he supposed to come from? He not, well, sh sure wasn't supposed to come from Herod, was he? Herod was Esau's descendant. We know that that's wrong already. He was on the throne, but here's Esau's throne. It's supposed to be one of Jacob's, not Esau's on the throne. So we got the wrong man on the throne. And Jesus is from the right family. Matthew gives Jesus lineage according to Joseph. Joseph was the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. And then Luke gives whose lineage? Mary's lineage. All right? Because that was his true lineage. But all of them go back through David, don't they? He's going to be a son of David. All right? What else? He's going to be born where? Bethlehem. Where is he going to be raised? In Nazareth. Nazareth means what? Nazareth means what? Root. He was a root out of dry ground. He was a root out of dry ground. Okay. Where would he be called? Where would he be called to go when he was young? To Egypt. And he said, I will call my son out of Egypt, which he did. What else? Huh? He would perform miracles. Miracles like nothing else that ever be seen. He raised the dead. He healed lepers. He what? And he made the blind see. That was an absolute messianic credential only. Only the Messiah would make the blind see. And he did. But did they accept it? No. What about the Greeks? What did the Greeks want? What do the Greeks want from God? Greeks are always been known for their minds, philosophy. That's why he used the word Sophia a minute ago, the highest form, okay? Long time ago, uh, there was a woman named uh, Livia Drusilla. Livia Drusilla. All right, Livia Drusilla. Her name became Flavia Julia Helena Augusta. Anybody who know who I'm talking about? Flavia Julia Helena Augusta. Who was what? No, not not. What? The wife of Octavian. All right, the wife of Octavian, Flavius Constantius Chlorus Octavius. All right. She actually wasn't his wife. She was his wife, but she was his concubine. All right. She was a barmaid. And uh, she had a baby. That baby grew up to be Constantine the Great, the ruler of what they called uh, the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. Uh, supposedly, uh, Helena, they call her Saint Helena in the Catholic Church. All right, here we're talking about all kinds of mythology and uh, legends, and the world is full of it. All right. Now, according to uh, the Catholic Church and uh, even uh, the Greek Orthodox, Helena uh, became a Christian. She was reading uh, the Bible and read the Bible in. In, uh, in secret because it was illegal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. Okay? And she got converted. Well, 
she prayed for her son, Constantine, because he was a pagan. And uh, his uh, father died, and he inherited the Roman Empire, supposedly, but there was another half-brother. So he had to go kill his half-brother to take the Roman Empire. So they were going to meet on this bridge, and they were going to fight. So now this is history, this is legend, and this is mythology, or whatever you want to call it, okay? He met there, and she was praying for him, supposedly, and God sent a vision. And it was a great storm. And up in the sky was a fiery cross. And it stayed there all day long. And it stormed so hard that they couldn't meet in battle. Finally, Constantine said, that's got to be some kind of a great sign, an omen. Did you see that cross, everybody? Oh, yeah, we saw the cross. So they took and they painted the cross on all of their shields. Okay? And when they met on the bridge to fight, his brother came out and he came out. His brother's soldiers were, some of them, many of them were secret Christians. Well, when they saw the cross, they wouldn't fight them, and they turned on their own people. Anyway, they, the opposing brother fell off the bridge and drowned. They cut his head off and marched it into Rome on a stick. And he decided to Christianize the whole Roman Empire. And uh, Helena, Flavia, Julia, Helena, Augusta. Now, the word Augusta means uh, your highness or queen on the end of that. Her name was changed from Livia Drusilla to these long Flavius, Julia, Helena, Augusta. She lived from about 273 to uh, about 339 or somewhere around there. Constantine reigned from 306 to 337. She reigned with him, that is. She decided when she was way up in her 70s to go to the Holy Land, to Palestine, and to uh, find all the sacred places where Jesus had walked. She went in there, she went to Bethlehem, and she went to Nazareth, and she went all of these different places, and she would uh, look for signs where these ancient miracles were performed and everything. She went to Bethlehem, and she found an uncovered, and they believe that that is the, probably the most reliable place in the whole land of uh, uh, Palestine where Jesus was actually born. They believe that that's where he was born. She went to the cave of Machpelah, which was already marked, Way Herod the Great built a, a great uh, uh, cathedral over the top of where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all of them were buried. Uh, anyway, so she went there and she marked that place. She went different places. She went into Jerusalem. And she went on the Mount of Olives and she said she found the rock where Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then she went over to Jerusalem and she found the exact place where the for the crucifixion. Not only that, but she dug up three crosses according to legend. And she said one of these crosses is the crosses that Jesus was crucified on. So there was a woman that was dying. She was dying on her, I mean this woman was no hope, she was dying. So they brought the three crosses and they had the woman touch one cross and nothing happened. And they brought another cross and she touched that cross and nothing happened. They brought the third cross, and she touched that cross, and she just jumped up with glee. This is legend, you know. This is according to Catholicism and all the legend. This is what happened, all right? Constantine took his whole armies, and he would baptize them as they'd walk through rivers. And he would come up to people, and if they wouldn't be Christianized, he'd hold a, throat to, a knife to their throat and say, Do you believe in Jesus? And if they didn't believe in Jesus, what would happen? He'd slit their throats. This is what you call forced conversion. That's the way he baptized and, and he did all of this. He built great church houses all over Europe and the Middle East to baptize people. And by the way, there was only one form of baptism. What form of baptism was that? Immersion. That's where we get the word baptizo, okay? That's the word right there, and that means to the Latin word is what? Equivalent. 
That's where we get our word, right there, mergio. So when you immerse somebody, you immerse them. All right? When you bury somebody, baptism is a, is a type of a burial, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, okay? Now, if you wanted to sprinkle something on somebody, what Greek word would you use? Rontizo, okay? That's that word, rontizo, with a rough breather on it. All right? Now, if you wanted to uh, pour, what would you use? Nipto. So we know what the right form of baptism is, don't we? Real easy from the scriptures. The scriptures just straighten everything out. All right? Well, Helena. Let's go back to the legend of Helena. You go back in history, and Constantine was supposed to be converted and everything, and he was supposed to Christianize the whole world, and he married the state and the church. You better watch out when the state and the church get married. That's an unholy union. Look what it evolved into, into the Catholic Church. That was the beginning of it. What else did he do? He, de he de declared that only his pastors could pastor the churches. All of us Baptists got run off, and many of them got killed back then. They were called Montanists. They were called Wieder Toppers in Germany. They were called uh, Novations. Many things. The Paulicians. But they were chased all over the whole Middle East and Europe and Turkey and Asia and Asia Minor, chasing them out, killing them by the millions. He killed his own wife and child. He murdered everything in sight. Does that sound Christian to you? And why did his mother go to Palestine? The Catholic Church just told you all the story, all this, how all these relics got over there now. But why did she go over there? The true story is she went over there to set up dioceses, major bishops or pastors. And they would watch over the area, and they would not allow anybody else to have any authority. Every mayor, every councilman, every person in any authority would be a Christian. Christianity was not being born again and believing in the Lord. Christianity was a state religion. And what did they do? Well, they declared that every child later on that was born only had a certain amount of time to be baptized and join the state church because if you were a citizen of the Roman Empire, you were going to be baptized and you are going to be a member of the church. And that's how we started all this godfather and godmother business because babies, they can't believe. So they have to have somebody to stand in and say, oh, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, all this kind of stuff, you know and make sure they'd be raised up there. This was a political thing. It didn't have anything to do with Christ. All right? All of this, Paul would fight, and he's trying to do his best to take this church that was an espoused bride of the Lord Jesus Christ and keep that kind of stuff out of it and cleanse it because, boy, were they... This church in Corinth is all messed up. It has all kinds of problems. We talked about the problems that had a little bit earlier. 22 now. Let's go into verse number 22. Epede. Kai. Eudeoi. Samia. Itusen. Kai. Helene. Helenes. Sophia. Zaytusen. And because her sins are in this manner, both the Jews. They want a sign. We just talked about the signs, didn't we? They want signs. They want miracles. That word sign means miracles. Did Jesus do plenty of miracles? Did it do the Jews any good at all? Only a few of them were saved. Even way back in the book of uh, Genesis, we find out that the church was going to be a Gentile church, a Japhethite church, because they would reject that they would carry out the gospel, not the Jews. The Jews were going to reject it. That was prophesied long ago. All right? Way back in the book of Genesis and many of the prophets also. 
the signs and miracles. They uh, uh, continue to request to this day. They were continuing to, to request it. Now, we, in the early churches, we had miracles, didn't we? Why did they have miracles in the early church? What was the first gift placed in the church? Of all the gifts, what? Apostles. Where was that done? During Christ's ministry. All right? Now, I want you to understand something. In, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, Jesus called his church out. Who did the baptizing? This is going to make you think. Now, who did the bat? Did Jesus baptize anybody? Who did it? His church. He had uh, lots of officers in the church. Did he have a treasurer? Who was the guy? Judas. <laughs> His name was Judah. Now, they got that mixed up a little bit in the New Testament. We got the book of Jude, we got Judah, and we got Judas. Now, all of it means Judah. There's only one name. It's Judah. So all of them should be Judah, which means what? Praise the Lord, the praise of God. What is the feminine name for Judah? Judy. Judy. Or Judith. All right. Well, Jesus had called his church out. <clears throat> By the way, before the day of Pentecost, did the church have the Great Commission? Did it have the Great Commission before the day of Pentecost? Yes. Did it baptize before the day of Pentecost? Had it had elections before the day of Pentecost? Yes. Did it have gifts placed in it before the day of Pentecost? The first gift. All right. Did it have the Lord's Supper before the day of Pentecost? Yes. All right. Just think a little bit about that now. All right. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. That was before the day of Pentecost. All right. What happened on the day of Pentecost? The church received the great power, the Shekinah glory of God, and it still is in the churches today. In the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, after the tabernacle was completely built and Moses had done all this, all these inspired people, what happened there? God immersed it with his Shekinah glory, that great cloud. What happens to Solomon's temple after it was completely built? What happened? God immersed it. And the church that was there and intact in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost was immersed in God's spirit and his Shekinah glory. Right there. Okay. Now the Jews seek a sign. Didn't do them one bit of good. The Jews rejected every sign that Jesus, they told him that he was doing miracles by whom? The olds above. They wouldn't believe it. They would not believe. They will harden their hearts. And the Jews had to completely re reject the, the kingdom. Who did Jesus hand the kingdom to? Matthew, the 16th chapter. The church. Not to Peter, by the way. The Catholic Church will say it was Peter. That is built upon Peter. And Peter means what? Petros means this little stone. But he said, I will build my church upon Petra. What does Petra mean? The great big rock. And the rock that followed G the Israel in the wilderness was whom? Jesus. And every time the, the Jehovah, the rock of Israel, who was that? Jesus. And he would be the big rock. And Peter himself said that we are all little stones built upon the great foundation stone, which is Peter? No, Jesus. All right, so we got that down. So the Jews are going to seek signs and they keep on requesting signs and the, group, the Greeks will want wisdom, philosophy. And they keep on seeking that. Third person, plural, present, indicative, active. Is this too hard? <laughs> all right. You'll get a little bit of that as you go. You'll get immersed in that as you go. All of one, they have Bob Tizo. That's a good one. That's easy. You remember that, won't you? Bob Tizo? You'll remember Nepto and Ron Tizo later. All right. See, these guys did. Cindy, how long have you been in my class? A year and a half. See that girl spitting all that stuff out? Himace. 123. Day. Carusomen. Christone. Christone is not a hard word because it sounds just like it does in English, doesn't it? Because our English word came from Christone. And then we have Estaromenone. Eudios, man, scandalon, ethnason, day, morion. All right, let's look at this now. 
Moreover, we, we preach Caruso. Remember the great uh, singer Caruso? His name from Greek means to preach or to sing, to sing forth, to bell her out, all right? We preach, all right? We don't discuss, we preach. We don't dispute, we don't debate, we preach. That's what Paul's apostle says. I'm not going to get up there and act like a bunch of your philosophers. I'm going to preach the word of God. I'm going to state. Jehovah Witness uh, Watchtower called me one time about five years ago. Uh, you know, on the website, there's three websites, four websites up with Dr. James M. Phillips or Dr. Jim, Discover the Word with Dr. Jim, Discover the Word dot com, and uh, Discover the Word com, all of these sermon audio dot com slash DTW. There's hundreds and hundreds of messages up there teaching what I'm teaching right here. Well, they called me one time. I, put, I made a mistake and put my phone number out there for a little while. That was a mistake. It didn't last very long. They called me on the phone, and this guy called me, and he said, I, and I, said, I, he said, I have listened to some of your messages. And he said, I know that you're a scholar, and I want to ask you some questions. I said, I will answer any question you want, but I am not going to argue with you. I said, you will not agree with what I'm going to say, but I said, if you want me to ask, don't ask me anything that you don't want an answer for. So we talked about staros, which we have in this verse right here. Estaromenon. Right there. And of course, you know, the Jehovah Witness, what do they say about the cross? It was a stake. It was a stake, because it was. That was the word originally. Who invented uh, staking people? Who were the ones that invented staking, impaling people? Who? The Assyrians, which was Nineveh. You go back there, and you, you go back in the Old Testament, and old, uh, remember the time that they were going to take, uh, Haman, was it Haman? Was going to take, uh, uh, what? Mordecai. 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 Yeah. Mordecai was going to be mordecai <laughs> on this stake. He said he was going to be hung on a stake. What they would do, they would take a poor, they would take a sharp a stake and, and sharpen it, and they'd put it up high. And they'd go up there with a ladder, and they'd set a person right on this sharpened stake, and it would go right up through their body, slowly. And they'd just leave them on there. And it would slowly rupture everything else, and they would be impaled. All right? This was the first form of crucifixion. That was what they called staking somebody. Then the Romans come along. And they said, we want to make them live longer. They're dying too fast. So we're going to put out this kind of a... We're going to make it worse. We're going to make them last longer. Maybe for days out there dying. And they put them on a thing like this. This is what they call a key. The, the Greek key. Word key. One leg here, one leg here, one hand there, one hand there. And he's just... They just stand out there for a long time. And they lasted for days. But this was too easy. This is the evolution of the word sorrows. And I told him this. Then finally the Romans invented this terrible way of torture. And on the side of it, as it looked like this on the side, a person's body would be hanging out here like this. They would even put a little seat here for the butt to sit on. Not for comfort but so they would last longer and so they could suffer. Some people stayed on this cross with a hand nailed here and they nailed them right through the carpal tunnel area because it would hold real good. Sometimes they even put a washer on a nail and they nail them through the feet. Sometimes they take the feet sideways and drive a nail through that way and sometimes one on top of the other and sometimes they would just spread them out and, and they didn't want them to be comfortable. That wasn't the idea. It was torture, long torture. Well, there is the final cross. And that's the ones that we dig up during the time of Jesus. We preach Christ crucified, not impaled as it started. By the way, they did use this stake for a while, and they nailed their hands up here like that, and they nailed their feet down here like that, but they died too soon. With this, like this or like this, they could pull themselves up and get a breath. 
what they actually died of when they got completely exhausted, they would die of suffocation. That's why they put the little seat for them to sit on. So they'd last longer. Days, sometimes two weeks, three weeks on this cross. Now the Jews demanded that they kill them, remember, because they didn't want them to, to, to uh, uh, blaspheme their great holy days. They didn't want them to pollute the holy days. We preach Christ having been crucified. Accuse these singular mass in participle passive. To the Jews. All right. Having been crucified to the Jews. Indeed, that little particle of affirmation, that word man there. And then skandalon. Have you ever heard the word in English? Is there a word from the Greek word skandalon? Huh? Scandal. What does that mean? A stumbling block. It means to offend somebody, to scandalize them, to offend or scandalize somebody. Ethnesen. Ethnesen. What Greek word, what English word do we have from ethnicen? Ethnic. All right. Ethnic backgrounds. That's what comes from this word here, ethnesen. Two nations. Weak adversity of conjunction, day, folly, foolishness. Uh, Rebecca, are you there? Can you read that, the last two verses, please? For while Jews demandingly ask for signs and miracles and Greeks pursue philosophy and wisdom, we preach Christ the Messiah crucified, preaching which to the Jews is a scandal and offensive stumbling block that springs a snare or trap, but to the Gentiles it is absurd and utterly unphilosophical nonsense. All right. Well, the Jews had plenty of miracles, didn't, didn't they? When Peter and when Jesus performed the miracles, when Stephen performed miracles, what happened? What did they do to Stephen there in seventh, seventh, seventh chapter of Acts? They stoned him and then bit him with their teeth. They chewed on him like dogs. The Jews called everybody dogs. They were all dogs. But it says in Greek that they went over there and they continuously... Mm -hmm. In perfect tense, kept on chewing and biting on him because they hated him. You know, like a barroom brawl when these two drunks and thugs get out there and they start chewing each other up. That's what they're biting each other's nose off and ears off and things like that. They do that. Heathens, to the heathens folly. Christianity has always been plagued with legends and superstition, hasn't it? And so has every religion. One thing that we've tried to separate in here is the superstition from the fact. We try to find out what the Bible really says about certain things. All right? 124. 124. Out toys. They, toys, clay toys. You day ois, hey, kai, hele, helesen, Christone, theu, dinamin, kai, theo, sophion. All right. Weak adversative conjunctive particle. Day. That's how it starts. Moreover, to them, the ones picked out, the ones elected. The Jews like to call themselves the elect, don't they? Have you ever tried to witness to a, uh, a Muslim? I've really worked on them a lot, and they worked on me too. <laughs> I had them try to convert me. Boy, they want to get a scholar converted, you know. They'd like to have one of them. But I, uh, you try to deal with them, and what do they say? I, I've had several of them say to me one thing, I am not going to work. I wouldn't have anything to do with a God that would pick somebody out and exclude and damn everybody else. That's what they say. And if you look at it from the Muslim's point of view, that's kind of like the way you look at it because Jews always says, we're the elect. Well, they were. <laughs> they got unelected during Jesus' ministry. They got unelected. All right. Now you are the elect. 
But the Jews still think they're elect. They're still over there in the Middle East fooling around over there right now thinking, we're the elect. You know what's going to happen to the Jews? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the tribulation period's coming upon them. They can get over there and they can say all they want to. They can politically do whatever they want to in the world. But the tribulation period is coming on this world to chastise. Two out of every three Jews is going to be killed before he can get them straightened out. He will use them for 1,000 years. They will be God's administrators on the kingdom, but the church will be glorified with him reigning from above the earth in his palace called New Jerusalem. And they're going to be down here on terra firma. <laughs> the old ground. Yes, they will glorify God for a 1,000 years. There's going to be a 1,000 feasts of booths a boost down there and five out of every six Gentiles are going to be killed and they're going to repopulate the world for a thousand years yeah they will lead out as administrators of God's kingdom on the earth but the church will be ruling and reigning with Christ in New Jerusalem how long forever that millennium is going to be over in a thousand years <laughs> and they're still going to be Israel the church is still going to be the church. To them, all of the ones picked out Jews, both, and to Greeks, Christ to God, dinamon, dinamon. What word in English comes from this word dinamon? What do you think? Dynamite. That's where dynamite comes from. This is, uh, this is a beautiful word. It's on page 107 in that analytical, uh, little analytical Greek lexicon. Now, it's really easy to find it. All the, these words are all cross-referenced to this. All right, dinamon. What's it say about that word dinamon down there? It has all authority, absolute dominion. It means majesty, absolute might, omnip omnipotence, efficacious energy and strength. Absolute capability to finish the act that has begun. Miraculous powers. Absolute grandeur. Extreme sovereign potentate. That's all in that word. Dynamis. Quite a word, isn't it? To them also, the ones picked out in both the Greeks and the Christ, God, the power of God, of wisdom. Power, all authority. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Let's go back there and look at that for just a minute. Matthew 28. Going over Matthew uh, Katamathion, the 28th chapter. This is what we call the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Verse 18, it says, I'm going to read it to you as a translation from Greek. And they worshipped him, in verse 17. Who worshipped him? The church members. This is church. He's the risen Messiah. He's getting ready to go up into heaven. He's telling the church something. And Jesus uh, came and he kept on talking to them in fumid language. That's the word, eleison. All right? He kept on talking to them. And what does laleo mean? We got... We got lego and we got erao. We've got laleo. What does laleo mean? What does that word laleo say? Laleo. What did you do when you said laleo? You used every part of speech in your mouth, and that means all human human language. We we try to make birds talk, don't we? I got a crow out there on the farm that talks. He makes all kinds of weird sounds. He sounds like a frog croaking, a dog barking, a cat meowing, all kinds of stuff. And man has taught birds how to minor birds and all this. We teach them how to talk. But you can always tell a minor bird from a person, can't you? Because they don't have all the 
the abilities of speech. What Jesus did, it's Jesus was really in a human body speaking to them. That's what it means right here, Lalaeus. To them, saying, Legon, was given to me all exousia, exousia, in heaven and upon the earth. As you have been kicked out, is what it says. Now, it doesn't say the, the, the command there, the imperative is not, go ye therefore, by the way. I know King James said that, but he missed the boat just a little bit. It says, after you've been kicked out, after you're gone, when you've been run out of here, this is prophecy, because they were going to be kicked out. They were going to be scattered, weren't they? The church in Jerusalem was going to be scattered because the Jews are going to go after them. Who gave the church more trouble than anybody else? Judaism. By the way, modern Judaism is founded upon the Pharisaical Mishnah that Jesus condemned. That's what I preached about on Sunday morning, remember? When he condemned the Mishnah. Their, their, uh, what? And the Talmud. The Talmud and the Mishnah. That was their uh, paradidomy. I can't think of the word in English. <laughs> What's the word paradidomy? What does it mean? Their uh, traditions. 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 <laughs> it means to hand over the things they had handed down. Their traditions, their dogmas. The rabbinical fathers had all thought up all this stuff. You know, the traditions. All authority in heaven and upon the earth. And after you've gone, make habitual learners. Mathetes. This is a discipleship class, isn't it? This is, you are habitual learners. You want to go a little bit further than the rest of them yonder guys out there, okay? Of all ethnes, of all nations, dipping them in the aisto onima, in the name, in the authority of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's a grammatical uh, imperfection there. Because when you got one, two, three, you would have names of, wouldn't you? If you got three or four guys, it would be in their names. But it says name here because we have only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is three. How many is he? Ooh, ahad, one. All right. Teaching them. To guard with their lives, terrain, all things I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you until the coming together, the completion of the age. The completion of the age. All right. You want to go any further? Is this enough? It's up to you. I'm your servant. <laughs> 24. All authority. By the way, before we f finish this verse, uh, in America, we have a government, don't we? We have a government? How does a government start? Where does it start? Where does it begin locally? You've got your mayor. You've got your supervisors. You've got your sheriff and all that kind of stuff. And all this is how, and then you go to what? Your governor and your representatives, your senate. It goes all the way up to the top. I want you to understand thing, something. As it said in, in the book of uh, Ephesians, we studied the book of Ephesians. We wrestle not against what? But against spiritual powers. Do you know that there are spirits and angels? By the way, spirits and angels are two different bunch. Spirit is an invisible uh, spirit. Ruach or pneuma in Greek. Ruach in Hebrew, pneuma in Greek. But angels what? Angels have form. Spirits don't. What do spirits do? What do they seek? What does the Spirit seek? To dwell in human or animal flesh. Angels don't do that. They have form. Okay? In every in, in the angelic world, in every government in the world, there are demon spirits and angels behind every level of government. Every level of government. You read the most you read the book of Revelation, we see that. I did 97 classes from Greek in Revelation. By the way, you can go on those websites and listen to them. Even watch them, a lot of them, can't you, Randall? There's quite a few of them up there on, on video. In every form of government, there are angelic and spirit beings all the way to the top, which is who? In the, in the bad side. 
Who's the top bad guy? Lucifer. Old Satan. And we have God on the other side. And I'm going to tell you something. Satan is powerful, isn't he? But God is omnipotent. We live, the God of this world, of this age that we live in today is old Satan. But one of these days, God's going to throw him in the, the bottomless pit and in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever. And we won't ever have to fool with him again, nor any of his skullduggery, and, uh, nor what we call unholy government. You go down on 14, 15 trucks and avenue, you better be able to buy justice down there because that's the only way you're going to get it. In any place else, all the way to the top. It's bad from everything. But God, in his permissive will, allows it to happen. But it's going exactly right where it's supposed to. And it's, everything's right on time. Everything's right on time. Well, we'll start at 125 next week. 125 next week. This is 5 and 2 and 12. By the way, somebody asked me if I'd ever taught this book before. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I saw my little marks in there for the years. It was 1980 when I taught this one. How long ago was 1980? 32 years ago. All right. I was teaching the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. I thank you for enduring those hard seats. I hope you learned something tonight from God's Word. And uh, if you missed something, you want to go listen to it again, go out there. Brother Randall is the webmaster of the website, and he'll have that up in nothing flat, like a flash. And you can go study it all over again if you want the CDs or DVDs, we have them available also. Brother John, he gets a stack of them every time he comes. Thank you for uh, being with us tonight. Brother Dick, would you dismiss us in prayer? Would you mind doing that? Go out and do something eternal. <laughs> Go out and do something eternal. I'll see you next week. Sunday morning at 9.30 and Sunday afternoon at 4.30 if you want some Hebrew from the book of Genesis. We'll do that. All right.